Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with the town of Vermilion, Alberta, Mayor Greg Theronson. The town of Vermilion believes that people can leave fuller, happier, healthier, and more productive lives through educational experiences in a pristine, natural setting away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. By visiting the community, friends, family, and couples will make the pilgrimage to Vermilion, which can change their lives forever. Only in Vermilion can you discover your passion. You can learn it, you can live it, and you can take it to the next level right in Vermilion, Alberta. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Greg Theronson. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for your time, for sitting down with me and talking about yourself and talking about the town of Vermilion. But I want to start by talking about you, if you don't mind. And I want to start with the question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Greg? Well, good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here in this interview, and it's uh, to be here to speak about the local community. Where did this all start? You know what? I actually had a an urge eight years ago. I actually ran for council, and I learned the hard way that year, and I didn't make it on as the top six in council that year. So I've always had that wanting to serve the community and be part of it instead of that person sitting on the sidelines uh always finding the uh, gloomy days and the stormy days. I was trying to add in the sunny days. Let's talk about the positives and being part of it. So before this previous election, two and a half years ago, I did have a lot of individuals reach out to me wanting to me to run for council. And, uh, you know, near the closer to the deadline of entering, I had some pretty prominent individuals ask me to run for mayor. Uh, they felt that because nobody had run yet, uh, they thought I had the proper personality possibly, um, the demeanor. Uh, I worked for the town for close to five years. I had pretty good understanding of it. So they pushed me into well, running for mayor. And, you know, it's it's a it's an obligation and it's it's pretty neat to watch your community grow. So you could have chosen many different ways to get back to your community. You could have chosen nonprofits, you could have chosen volunteerism. But you chose municipally, and I want to ask this question in a weird way, because you just said you were part of the administration for five years prior to putting mm -hmm. yourself on the ballot. Did you ever think that you'd be a politician one day? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could. It's, it's funny. I actually had uh, an individual I coached hockey 25 years ago reached out to me. He says, uh, Mayor Tronson, I can't believe you're mayor. You're a great hockey coach. Congratulations. You deserve this. Uh, many friends that I went to high school with have texted me that I've never heard of in 20 years. Um, the Yes, maybe they're more surprised than me, but no, I, I was, wasn't was a born to be politician, I think. It's not what I dreamt to be, uh, but it was something like you said. Instead, I am a volunteer in town, but it was just that one extra step of thinking that I could help the community that much more as the mayor. Municipal politics is often described on this show as the government of proximity. The decisions you make at that council table impact your residents more than probably provincial or even federal. Um, for you, was it always a desire when you were looking at politics and talking about politics municipally you were talking about? Or traditionally, like most people around the dinner table growing up, was it provincial and federal politics discussed? Um, you know, growing up, I guess it was more of a provincial. I mean, uh, going back to the 
uh, Don Lahey, the, the all the days of all the great premiers, uh, Ralph Klein. Uh, we've had some great municipal leaders come through our through the constituency of Vermilion and Steve West, Lloyd Snellgrove, uh, very prominent people. And that's where I saw it at a provincial level, but I knew I would never be able to be at that provincial level. The intellect you have to have and the knowings of what's going on worldwide, let alone province-wide, and just knowing how to handle your demeanor and, and people and the public. They, those individuals, I mean, would be idols to me, how they handled themselves. And uh, so I just thought, no, let's just start at ground zero, ground level, municipal and it is a whole different bag of worms what we're dealing with here at a municipal level at a local level it's so different was it eye-opening because this is your first term in office and i say first term you ran in 2013 but you were first elected in 2021 looking back on now three years going into your fourth year later on this year is it what you expected from what you imagined the role was going to be to compared to what it actually has been or yeah. is it pretty similar than what you expected because you had that administrative background. No, it's it's not even what I even uh, imagined or even half of what I've imagined. Um, speaking to some gentlemen before, of course, when I put my name in, I kind of asked, you know, what should I expect? Uh, how many meetings to go to time-wise, um, obligations, uh, knowledge, reading, how much reading should I be doing weekly? Yeah, it's even more than what they said. So it was quite overwhelming. Uh, just what you had to learn so much and even in the first six months was again overwhelming but it was a challenge to take on and I know I still haven't read near as much as I should have uh, they got to put more things on uh, audible so I can listen while I drive instead of have to do all this reading but uh, no it isn't and what I have truly learned is um, even though I consider myself still Greg Tronson you still have that title in the community whether you want that title or not whether it's a seven-year-old that stopped me in the rink one day and wanted a picture with me, I didn't understand that. But if I was that seven-year-old many moons ago, I could put myself in his shoes and say, okay, I got a picture with the mayor when I was seven. And I didn't see that until lately more and more, how much it impacts everybody around me. You you do traditionally wear your cap 24 seven. The moment you step outside your door, you are the mayor. Even in your day to day job or even when you're going to the grocery store just to grab milk, how important is it, though, for that engagement to happen? Because you are elected by the people, even the people who didn't vote for you, you have to represent. How important is it for yourself to listen to everyone on issues that are pre prevalent to them? Because I can imagine now after three years, you've come to the realization you're not pleasing 100% of the people on the decisions you make, but you are the mayor for those people as well who don't agree with the decisions you make. Uh, absolutely. You encounter everybody, every walk of life. You're uh, uh, the naysayers, the, the haters, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and that's the walks of life. Uh, I had a friend tell me, if you uh, make 100% of the people happy all the time, you're doing something wrong. And, and that's very true. You you have to disappoint people, whether it be in a budget uh, taxes, anything, a decision on road uh, resurfacing, whatever. But, oh, I absolutely engage everybody. I have been cornered in a, a few interesting situations, um, but you handle it all with proper demeanor and professionalism. And you have to respect everybody's opinion is their opinion. We, we live in Canada and they're allowed to have that opinion. And if they want to see me in the store and corner me in the milk aisle and say, you know what, you shouldn't have done this. That's their entitlement. And I, I respect it even more when they want to come up to me and say it. A lot of people won't come up to a mayor and, and do that in that context. You are the you are the vote on council. You you, along with your fellow counselors, have to make those tough decisions. Speaking on you just for you right now, how do you make those tough decisions? Because the decisions you make at that table, as we talked about the government of proximity are going to impact people potentially negatively, but you know that you have to grow the community. You have to continue to service the community. You have to still offer things that people are looking for from a community perspective. For you, how do you make those tough decisions to be able to put your head down at night and say, okay, I've made the best decision with the information I've been provided? I guess I go back to, a. I, I try to throw some logical into it. I mean, I think most individuals will. will. Uh, I think I have a strong sense of morals and I, I mix in a, a good dose of morals into it. Common sense 
what I think of a long-term decision, if, if we're making short-term decisions in these and it's a two to three year win, well, what does that mean in 45 years? Does that mean it's a loss? So I really try to put in that long-term thought more. Being that I worked for the town, I saw some of the, the good and the bad. So I can put in some of the moral working in it, can see the moral or lack of moral sometimes or common sense. Uh, so somebody sitting in an office just looks at a piece of paper and say, well, that's how it should be done. No, not until you actually go out on the street and do it. It doesn't make sense. On paper, it does. But in reality, it doesn't. I think I have that application that I can put towards these decisions in many ways. My upbringing, my, my surroundings is what adds to it, too. Morals are great. And I understand that everyone has their own belief system in with inside mm -hmm. them. But the moment you walk into that council chambers, you have to have an open mind on every single issue because your fellow councillor, your deputy mayor, a resident may come in and give a delegation or give a speech and say, oh, I didn't think about it that way. How hard is it to sort of take away what you're hearing and check it with what you believe in and your morals that you stand for? Because I can imagine that's a probably challenging part of the job. Oh, absolutely. And uh, those people that come in with those comments, views, um, some, sometimes they're just loaded guns with spitefulness in them, <laughs> you know, what? looking for that debate. And it's hard to believe. You don't say so, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> but you respect that too, that loaded gun coming in. Because they're to say, you know what, I voted you in. And and I'm okay with that. But I still stick with the what I I already have in my mind, my moral sense. Uh, when they're bringing up the question, I'm already building in my mind morally what I see as what my answer will be. And uh, I don't have to think, okay, I know this person, I should answer it this way. No, I, I don't pick and choose my personalities of how I should answer to that guy. It stays with the Greg answer. I have noticed over the last few months, year and a half of starting this show, that when I ask the question about engagement, I get a range of answers about resident engagement. Now, I'd be hard pressed to say that provincial and federal politics is the bee's knees of politics, but it seems to be getting the most engagement. People are passionate. Mm -hmm. But there's the sense that as long as my water's turned on when I go have a shower, as long as my garbage is picked up, as long as my taxes are relatively low with what I need, I'm okay with what's going on at City Hall. Would you would you say that in the town of Vermilion, people are engaged on what's going on at City Hall or are they tuned out and they just are comfortable enough with the decisions that you and your council have to make on a week to week basis? Or do you get the engagement that you look for to make those tough decisions? Uh, that's a wonderful question. I would say we do get engagement, okay. but it's not from the uh, a bigger group than what you would expect. You know, we're not having hundreds of people show up at our door with pitchforks and uh, whatnot to get us. There are the strong-minded individuals that are in every community. And we appreciate that, what they're bringing here. But when we think out of 4,100 people and we're upsetting the five or six uh, in the apple cart, that's, again, as I said earlier, you're not going to make 100% happy. Uh, so no, I think we're making those decisions. We're getting the feedback and we're seeing their point of views. We respect it and understand it, but we're still governing for the majority of the people in the proper process for longevity of the town, not short-term gain. On the flip side of that, when they do engage with you, whether it be something that's going on in the community, do they understand the role that the municipality plays? Because I, I I have spoken to many residents in my time across this great province, across this great country, and I can tell you, the municipal issues are not the thing that people mostly talk about when they talk to their mayor or councillor. They'll talk about healthcare. They'll talk about the education system. They'll talk about what's going on on highways. But those are not in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality. Do you get a sense that people understand in Vermilion what the role is for the municipality? You nailed, you hit the nail on the head, absolutely. No, actually, a lot of individuals don't. And, and they do think, okay, the mayor, you decide everything. The mayor, you decide <laughs> when garbage is picked up. You decide when snow removal is done. You decide taxes. You decide everything that goes on in the town every minute, every day. 
which is the farthest from the truth. And that is a slow process as you teach one individual at a time. And I have told them many a story to many individuals. No, I don't actually decide that. That's in a policy. That's in a bylaw. We decide that as a council. I have a CAO. I have an infrastructure director. We all have individuals that do their jobs. I don't decide that on a daily basis. And it blows quite a lot of people away. They're like, oh, no, you decide, Greg. Why isn't the snow moved over there? You know what? It's not my decision. Why are there gophers over there? You know what? That's not my decision. We set the policies. So it is quite a a shock to some people. Yes, I think a lot of people do not understand the educated side of it, the process. How do you how do you educate someone without trying to seem like you're being not, I don't want to say rude because that's a disrespectful thing because you want to give the respect to the people even because yeah. Yeah. traditionally you 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 wanted this job. You literally ran to do this job so therefore you are educated to do this job. The average resident doesn't have time to do the job that you're doing because that's why you ran they didn't. So exactly. how do you tell people that's not my job without telling them that's not my job because they are coming to you for a reason. They don't understand that if they need something fixed about the snow removal or why there's something going on in the community, they don't know to go to the director of uh, finance, the director of community yeah. services, X, Y, or Z, heck, the, even the CAO, they're coming yeah. to you for a reason because they know who you are. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I have to quote Seinfeld serenity now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you got to take a deep breath with some individuals because they are they're coming with a, a steam full for you. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I try to talk to them in this demeanor that I'm having a conversation with you. Uh, I point out the facts that, no, this isn't my job. Everybody has different uh, roles in our town. And I just try to explain to them the building blocks of how we do this. Uh, we do the budgets, we do policies, we do bylaws, we we do all those things, and we have people in place that make those decisions that follow our policies and bylaws that we make. And most people do, they get the recipe, but they most some will still walk away with, oh, well, that's just a political answer, so you are never going to win them over anyways, and I'm fine with that. I want to turn to the, the town of Vermilion as a whole for the next 15, 20 minutes, if possible. Yeah. And I want to uh, start by first prefacing this conversation with this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. He is one vote on said council. A majority of votes pass things. He is one vote of that council. But... The issues that we talk about may line up with what's being talked about at council, but at the end of the day, this is still his opinion. Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this in 2024, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the town of Vermilion today? Oh, I, I think it's like every little town of, we have to generate enough money. We're like a little business in my mind. If we don't generate generate enough money to keep the household running, which is our town, then we have to look for outside sources or increasing our income, our revenue to make the town go. One of our problems right now is uh, infrastructure that is aging. And you got to remember when these towns were really booming in the 40s, 50s, 60s, we we're actually starting to encounter a lot of these infrastructure aging and it's not a few thousand dollars to replace aging in infrastructure. Uh, that's probably our biggest challenge of so much upkeep now of infrastructure alone. And, and we can't, you can only do so much in one season, in one summer. Um, you only have so much cash flow a year. And, and when you ask for that extra $12 a month per household in taxes, they're wondering, well, where's that going to? Well, infrastructure, roads, paving, replacing sewer lines. Uh, sidewalks, curbs, uh, bricks, it just, it all adds up. Does that kind of see where I'm going with here? That's our it biggest It does, challenge. it does, and it does, it, it begs the question because municipalities are at a sort of crossroads right now when it comes to infrastructure funding. The province would say, and I've had Minister McIver on the show, and he has said, we, we've just given you more money. We've tied it to uh, resource revenue with the LGFF. So therefore, yeah. you're always going to continuously ask for money. But you see your budget every year, and you know that you can't run deficits. 
No. Have you, and I say you as the royal you as the town of Vermilion, had to put off infrastructure projects because you just don't want to have to raise the money that you potentially might need because everything cost a lot more than it did in the 40s and 50s when these infrastructure projects were actually being put into the ground? So that would be t a little bit tough for me to actually say with an honest answer because being that I've only been in for two and a half years, I wasn't sure what the plans were of previous council. So when they got in six and a half years ago, they probably had different hopes and dreams of what their theory was for infrastructure. But then when we come in, we see a completely different light at the end of the tunnel that we need to deal with. And if they put off a couple, and that could add up to four years, well, that's that's a four-year put off of, uh, of some infrastructure. That adds up fast. And, and that's what we've had to actually take on now is dealing with a very large infrastructure upgrade right now of $7 million that has been put on our plate over the last year and a half that we have to deal with. What project? So we're redoing our whole sewer line, our main water sewer line from one end of town to the other. And it is already at, if you, if you hear the term, 103% capacity. Not sure how that pipe stretches, but it does. Um, and it is slowing down our residential development at our west end of town. We cannot put on 20, 30 more houses because that we will have uh, an explosion. So we are dealing with a five-year project at 1.4 million a year to get this project done over the next, which adds up to 7 million over five years. And this project, I'm not speaking that it has been put off, but it there was an explosion of the line back in 18 or 19 that really it probably should have been addressed there. And that's when I worked for the town that, it was a it was a bad project and it's in a bad place to get at. Is it hard to look at those types of projects worth a big hefty price tag with the realities that we live in right now? The economy is not the best. And I think you and I will both admit that like twelve dollars yeah. may seem like a, not a lot to a lot of people. But to people who are paycheck to paycheck, who have just lost their job, twelve dollars is a lifeline for some people. Yeah. How do you as counsel look at in big infrastructure investments with the realization that province has given as much as they're going to give. The federal government is not going to potentially give money because they're looking after the big seats and you're, and I hate to say you're in an urban rural setting because you're not in a large city like Edmonton or Calgary. So how do you as council have to navigate the path forward with the realization that it's going to be tough for your residents right now? Yeah, uh, so navigating there, then then we start leaning on administration a bit more. So administration's got to find the the grants, um, work the numbers. Where can we steal from Peter and lend it to Paul for a little bit? And I don't mean that as forever, but you know, if we were going to redo a road, maybe one this year, maybe that road a road can survive for a year. A couple potholes isn't going to ruin the town. But when we have an infrastructure of a sewer line that could explode, which adds up to an extra half a million, I would say that priority overtakes a couple potholes in a road. Um, we really got to lean on administration doing their job and their duty, finding this grant, finding this free money, uh, really pushing on our local MLA, whether it be provincially and federally. Uh, I appreciate Shannon Stubbs is super busy, swamped with what she's doing. Uh, I think she gets 90% of the vote, but we can appreciate that she's still got to support some of us local constituents and towns to for the betterment of the area. It's still her region that she needs to help support, and that's who we got to lean on, too. So uh, you, you talked about yeah. growth. You, you talked about growth there for two seconds, and I just want to yeah. just – it seems to be a topic that a lot of mayors are talking about right now municipalities are at the at capacity you literally have a pipe that is at 103 percent capacity yeah. so if you do not fix it it is going to get worse for you and i hate to say it this way but shit is going to be up creek without a <laughs> in some sense there mayor um and guess who's at the end of the river is it? the mayor is usually standing in it so don't worry yeah. so I, growth can't come without infrastructure and i and i hate to play the chicken the egg here but how do you grow your community while realizing that you have to do it on the backs of the people who are there right now because if you don't get the new housings built the new infrastructure in place to build those houses people won't move to your community so therefore you have a 
a stagnant, and I say stagnant in the most respectful way possible, tax mm-hmm. base. What mm-hmm. is the town of Vermilion doing to set up to ensure that once this project is done, the potential development, the potential growth that you hope for in the West End will just explode and be able to offset some of the pains that we are going through right now? I, I guess the dog is chasing his tail in a circle. You're, you're absolutely right there. No. Uh, that that comes with the economics. of You have to rely on your local economics too on that. So if we build it, they will come. So we build the infrastructure. Something has to come first. So the infrastructure has to come. We can't build 20 houses without this infrastructure. When we do provide the housing, that brings the business because we are having more businesses come to town. So when they come to town, they bring the builders, the workers, the teachers, the nurses. They have the new houses that they want to build for their next 40, 50 years of their life. I think the process is there. You have to let the the natural progression of the economics of your community. I can't guide it. If, If a council tries to guide that with a true stick, you're going to miss the end goal. We have to provide the services with the infrastructure and let the economics, I think, take control from there. Does that kind of, do you see where I'm going here? It does. If we don't build a pipe. It, go ahead. It, well, if we don't build that pipe, we're not building houses. So we haven't even started a project then. So we're starting it. We'll let the economics, the people, the house builders to continue it and finish it. So, but the, 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 the then the flip side is are people wanting to invest in Vermilion? Do you get the sense that if the infrastructure was in place, you would have people knocking on your door, building businesses, building commercial real estate, building just uh, homes in your community? Or do you get get a sense that you are sort of looking at Vermilion not in 2025, but you're looking at Vermilion in 2045, 2085, yeah. and that's yeah. what you're trying to do in 2024? Yeah. No, I think there, we we are on that edge of expansion. Uh, no, Vermilion has been in that 3,900 to 4,100 people for 20 years. So there is that, we are on that verge of seeing the residential maybe make that boom. And to us, a boom is eight, 10 houses built in a year, and that would be great. So we are on that cusp. We have land ready for industrial building, for business, for agriculture, et cetera. So we've got that land in place. We're just trying to generate the interest there. Um, I think we have everything in place. We just, we need the people, we need the investment. We need the families to step up and say, okay, town, you've got the land. Let's get it ready. We'll buy it. We'll continue on the economic upswing for Vermilion. So how do you put Vermilion on the map? Because this conversation, I could literally transpose it into any other small town and I say small town, 5,000 population community across Canada right now. What is what is this council, what is this administration doing to put Vermilion on the map to make it a destination for potential new growth five years from now or even for two years from now? Well, uh, I go back a few months. One of the councillors said, are we in the middle of nowhere? Are we actually in the middle of something? And it's a good way of looking at and you really look at our location where we're, ha- we're between Edmonton and Lloydminster. We're halfway between Saskatoon and Edmonton. Do people want to drive through Lloydminster? Could we be a service to a lot of truckers, uh, et cetera, using Highway 16, huge transportation corridor? We are a, a very, very main corridor of Highway 41 north and south, literally from Texas to Fort McMurray, uh, trying to advertise that. So when we're sitting at those crossroads, that's that's we have to take advantage of that. We've got the land to do that. That's what we're trying to say is we're in a good location here. We're thinking outside the box as we're, we're a young council. We're not coming in with that government frame You're of mind. You're a fresh council too, aren't you? Like there's Absolutely. one, I think there was one incumbent who yep. won re-election in uh, Vermilion, right? Yep, six of us brand new and, and one uh, gentleman that was, uh, yeah. A returner, yeah. So that's okay. you know that's what I'm getting at. We got to sell what what we have for location. What's our benefits as location? What's the character of the people in Vermilion that want to see it? And uh, I give tribute to uh, the president of the Lakeland College when I ask her for advice because I think she speaks so wonderfully and she she acknowledges how great of a community we are and how well we work together. If, if we don't 
work with them and they don't work with us, we don't have a partnership. And one of her words of advice to me a few months ago, was, she said, Greg, it's about the, the character of our community. Everybody has individuals in their community, but we have that character that wants to excel and make our community stronger on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We want to make people feel welcome here. Uh, it's the character. I want to, so it brings up the next sort of part of the second segment, and that is the thing that you're most proud of. When you look at Vermilion from a council perspective, from a administration perspective, what's the thing that you look back on? And you say, you know what? We might have our challenges like every other community, but we're doing this right. When you go to Alberta municipalities, when you talk to other leaders or even people in your community and they say, Greg, there's nothing going on in our community. So you know what? That's untrue. We're doing this right right now. What is that thing for you? Oh, that's that's a great question. We're keeping the word vermilion in people's minds by going to these conventions. We're a group of five or six. We communicate like crazy at them. We visit. We put the word vermilion in people's minds. And that's the first thing we're doing properly. Uh, because maybe in six months, they're thinking, I wonder where we should go. Hey, vermilion, the guy was there, the counselor I spoke to, he had some great ideas. Let's reach out there. That's one thing we're doing good. We're, we're an active council. We don't go sit at these conventions and sit at a table and just hope things will come to us. We're very active. Um, we're trying to be progressive. We've brought in this uh, high-speed fiber internet uh, to all the houses and all the business. And we've spoke to a lot of individuals on that. That's a big plus because there's a lot of communities that don't have that, especially communities our size. So that's a big win for your community. And I, mean, I hate to interrupt here, but that was a huge win when I was looking into some of the things on your website and I was looking at what's going on. I was like, oh, wow, like you have fiber optic and it, like a lot of, again, communities would just jump at the opportunity to have that like that's a massive win for you so good good job you <laughs> well thank you and i mean that all started with actually probably two councils ago that it started and and then the previous council did a lot of the legwork and we were just uh able to benefit and uh, certainly wasn't 100 percent me in any way uh i guess we get a little bit of the accolades from it but no that that is huge to our community and it's been a slow process we're winning people over. We've got some businesses on it that really appreciate it, the speed, the capacity, uh, the convenience of it. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a slower road to fulfill than we thought, but we're getting there. You know, that we, we were expecting that? a boom. Well, we expected okay. a big win in the first year when really it was a bigger project and a and a bigger challenge than what I think a lot of us thought, right? Uh but isn't it doesn't yeah. it go back to the 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 conversation we just recently had about you have to set up your community not for tomorrow but for two years ten years from now and even though you don't see the benefits potentially the or the the windfalls that you might have wanted to in 2024 Absolutely. maybe in 2030 you, you'll look back and go you know what we did it and look at it now and that's that's exactly what will happen and that's the short term of these people coming up to us. We had to put some money into it. We're we're partners in this infrastructure of the high speed fiber, and people are saying, "Well, what did we get out of it last week?" Well, but we're not looking at it last week or even the next week coming up. It is a long term investment, 20, 30, 40 years, and being ahead of the other communities the same size, not only in Alberta but in Western Canada, we have to compete directly with what Western Canada sounds our size. I want to turn to my last subject because I'm cautious of time here and it's my favorite. And I want to know about some tourist destinations. I believe that municipalities don't often talk about their great tourism spots. their great hidden gems, if you will. And I am coming through Vermilion later on in July because I've made a promise. If you come on the show, I'm coming to your community. So I've got a big swing through central east north uh, uh, Alberta. And Vermilion will be my one stop because I'm going to stop there. And Lakeland College to go see the Fire Emergency Training Center because I've spoken to the dean there. Um, but from your perspective, perspective as the mayor of the community what are the hidden gems that you tell people if you come you have to come see this spot this business this amazing view what do you what do you recommend wow you've uh <laughs> put you, you on the through, spot 
Yeah, if you thought you were going to corner me, no, I, that's that's an easy one to answer. And I appreciate you actually bringing this up. And you actually covered a lot of the topics already. I mean, uh, as far as what the Lakeland College brings to our community, the people it brings in, the families, the kids, the experience, the economics they bring in. As a tourist, you're not understanding that, but that. As a tourist, you want to come see our provincial park. We're one of, I think, only two communities in Alberta with a provincial park literally bordering, touching our town with miles of trails, uh, soccer fields. What's the fields, park's name? Like Sorry, for, just Vermilion Provincial Park. Oh. 140 <laughs> some campsites with power and it's been here since 86 or 87. Uh, it's jam packed every long weekend. Uh, a wading pool, a kid's pool, uh, trails, soccer fields, ball diamonds, uh, close to the town to walk downtown and do your shopping. Our other hidden gems, we have a, a downtown that has such a, a a wonderful feel to it. Everybody's so inviting, and we have such variety down there with it, with the bakery and all the clothing stores and et cetera. We just, they're all so welcoming. It goes back to the word character. And those people are what help make Vermilion look what they are. Not me. It's not me sitting in those stores, sitting on the back of that counter promoting Vermilion. It's those individuals that have put their money and their time in to make as a whole Vermilion better. Uh, of course, there's some gems of stores down there of businesses, but I don't want to pinpoint just one. That's not fair. I, no, I, I would never make you give a Sophie's choice here. I'd never no. make you choose what your favorite. But there's there every single one would be great to go to. You're going to benefit in every store you go to. Um, really, one of the biggest hidden gems, and this would blow your mind, is you have to come to our Vermilion Agricultural Fair. It is three days of the most fun you can have at the end of July you could ever witness. And, and I call it one of the best, best. And I say this with, I know that I'm going to upset some people here, particularly in Lloyd Minster. One of the <laughs> best parades I have ever been to was in Vermilion for their agriculture fair. And that's just my little plug there. So if you, if you don't do anything, Go to the parade because you will get a lot of candy. <laughs> Absolutely, it is it is a gem it is a gem of a parade. Uh, when we have people four people four people deep for two miles, and you don't recognize thirty percent eighty percent of the people, that means your community is doing something right. And when you've got people coming from St. Paul, Bonnieville, Lloyd Minster, Wainwright to be part of your parade, you're doing it right, and you're welcoming to all those people. I mean, it's the most, I spend 10 days at that fairgrounds because it is a blast. The the community involvement, the camaraderie, and it's not just individuals in town, it's the farmers, the welders, the, everybody in town that just give their free time and come make it a success. And not one person wants any notoriety out of it. I don't even want to know people that I'm there helping donate. It's just the, that fun. And we all benefit at the end of the day. That three days, I tell you, you need to sleep for two days once you're done that three it is. <laughs> I remember covering it for the Lloyd Minster source. I remember those days afterwards where I was like, oh, <laughs> just just give me my bed. Don't talk to me for a week because I walked and talked to too many people because it, it was a close knit community. It, um, it is something when you explain it to people what happens here, the dollar values, the fun of what we put on. People just can't fathom it. It, it just it really blows them away what we accomplished in three days. Twenty eight thousand people through the gates last year in three days. I can imagine and we're a town of, of 4,000. I can imagine during those uh, dark years, a few years ago, I'm just going to put mm -hmm. that, that it mm -hmm. probably did take a toll on the community when you weren't able to get out and celebrate like every other year. And now that it's back, you're probably so happy that people are able to connect and chat with each other and bring that character back to the great community of Vermilion. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's so, uh, mentally stimulating and just helps the people appreciate seeing and getting out and visiting and talking and forgetting about the dark years. Let's move on with life. For you though, is there a special spot in the community that you can go and decompress after a long day, whether it be work, whether it be council meetings, is there a day, is there a spot in the community you go, you know what, after a long day, I need to re recenter myself. Is there a spot that you can go to and just refocus yourself knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and try to make Vermillion better off than you left it the day before? 
Yes. Um, is it going to be your house? Please tell me it's not your house because that's where most mayors go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got some good friends. Uh, I go visit some good friends and we'll sit and have a visit and they'll help me decompress. They'll help me vent. They'll listen. They'll, uh, they'll be my counselors. And I certainly appreciate them. Uh, I've got a few round tables I go to, I guess you could say. And what, what's said at the round tables stays at the round table. Um, I'm a dirt biker. I'm a dirt biker. So I get out on the dirt bike and burn some stress off that way. Uh, even just going out and working on my bike or doing some stuff in my yard helps me try to forget some of the things. Yeah. And just realize that we're trying to do the best. So yeah. my final question for you here, Greg, and it's an important one. We started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the great community of Vermilion. And I've got to ask the question. I think every municipal leader knows how to answer. So I'm putting you on the spot here. But what makes Vermilion such a unique place to live, to work, and raise a family? Well, I don't. I, you know, I've already said it, but I don't want to repeat what every other community can be too. Uh, you know, you can mention crime, you can mention uh, availability of businesses, uh, schools, hospitals. You can mention all that. Uh, I just go back to the kindness in the community. When when we have people come through and when I have people come here for meetings and the first thing they say to me, they said, wow, Mayor Tronson, your, your town is so clean and so polite and so forgiving. And uh, the individuals here are just, they make you feel so welcome at home. And when you're compared to other communities and you're still the number one community of the other three or four or five, that's very humbling. It just feels great when those, you're not trying to promote that. It's not like I told them to say that. The community sells itself. You know, uh, I'll support it 110% and, until I'm done this duty, but, and I'll continue to support it until the day uh, God takes me to a better place some days. But it, it's it's just the setup of the community and, and how people show that true, honest sincerity of wanting everybody to be happy when they're here. Mayor does Thompson. that make sense? It that does. And it was it was a perfect picture to end this interview on. You have painted a true character of what Vermilion is. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this, sitting down and discussing yourself, discussing the great community of Vermilion. Hopefully when I come up in July, we can grab a coffee or we can go uh, go to the bakery because a guy my size, if I hear bakery, I'm heading to a bakery no matter where I am. <laughs> That is great. And we'll go to the trails afterwards to the provincial park and burn off the donut. But whoa, you whoa, are whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I know that's crazy talk, but we're, we're trying to make ourselves look smart here. So let's let's stick with the oh, topic. Yes. Oh, yeah. We'll go for a walk, mile walk. We'll fix the yeah. infrastructure funding. <laughs> Greg, I appreciate your kindness to sit down and talk about your community. It seems like you have a great community on your hands and it seems like your community is better served with you at the table. So thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. I appreciate your time and your sincerity too, to reach out to me and taking your time to let me acknowledge of how proud I am to be part of this community and, and part of being one of the leaders. There's many leaders in this community that go unspoken and unsung heroes, but because of my title, yeah, I'm a leader and I will continue to be. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a positive and things are looking good. And um, my final phrase for the day would be, and I always refer to what my mother used to say, if, if things were bad, she would always say, Gregory, it's going to be okay. And it is going to be in Vermilion. It's going to be okay. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content that we have coming up for the later part of June and even potentially into July before we hit our summer hiatus. We're at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Convention here in Calgary over the weekend. So please, if you are there and you see us, be sure to come and say hi. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.